It's been a while since we've done a cattle topic, so this week we are talking about the genetics and the inheritance of polling in cattle. By polling, I mean the natural lack of horns. This is actually a relatively neat topic for something to do with genetics because the inheritance of being polled versus being horned is relatively straightforward because it's controlled mainly by one gene. There is a little bit of genetic jargon, but bear with me, I will explain everything as I go. The first things first, every living thing carries a genotype. That means it's genetic code. Equally, everything has a phenotype. The phenotype is what is actually expressed, what you see before you. For almost all genes, we have two copies and we tend to inherit one from our father and one from our mother. Genes can come in different versions. We call these different versions alleles. In many cases, one allele can override another. The allele that overrides another we call dominant and the allele that is overridden we call recessive. If there is a standard or much more common allele we tend to call that the wild type. Wild type cattle are horned. It's a bit like a default state. However, very occasionally mutations occur to individual genes creating new alleles. So when you mate a horned bull to a horned cow around about one in 20,000 of the resulting calves will be polled. In cattle, this polled allele is dominant to the non-polled allele. So if a calf receives one of each, a polled allele and a non-polled allele, the phenotype of that calf will be polled. To get a non-polled, i.e. horned calf, you would need two copies of the recessive non-polled allele. That is the wild type. I'll try and demonstrate it on screen as best I can. The scientific convention is to give dominant alleles in uppercase, whereas recessive alleles tend to be in lowercase. So if P is the gene for polling, the capital P will be the dominant allele that results in polling, whereas the little p is the non-dominant or recessive allele that would result in a horned calf. Remember, each animal has two copies of this gene in any potential combination. So some examples, let's take a bull that we know to have two copies of the dominant polled gene. That might be because he's from a breed we know to be entirely polled, like the Aberdeen Angus. It might be because we've had him genetically tested and we know that is his genotype, his genetic code. So on our diagram, he will be represented by two capital P's. Again, a little more jargon, when an animal has the same two copies in its genetic code, we call that animal homozygous because those copies are homo, the same. The opposite would be where it has one of each, we call that heterozygous, hetero meaning different. So this bull is homozygous polled. Let's say we make that bull to a heterozygous cow. In most cases, suckler farmers won't know the status of their cows. Some pedigree breeders might, but in general, it's an unknown. For argument's sake, let's say she's heterozygous, so she has a capital P, and a lowercase p. She herself would have been born polled because like we said, that capital P for polling is dominant to the lowercase p, which if it wasn't being dominated by the capital P would give you a horned animal. Now that resulting calf is going to inherit two copies of that gene at random from its parents, one from each. As you can see, all of those combinations have a capital P. Therefore, the phenotype, the end result is going to be all of those calves are polled, although half are homozygous polled and half are heterozygous polled. So those heterozygous calves, although they'll be polled themselves, they remain carriers of that non-polled gene, so they retain the potential to generate horned calves. At this point, you can note the discrepancy and difference between the genotype. These animals have different genotypes, but in practice, the phenotypes are all the same, so you can't distinguish these animals by eye. Let's go for another example. We put a horned bull over a horned cow. Because we know that the little p is recessive, that is is if there's a capital P present, it gets dominated. We know for an animal to have horns, it can only have copies of that lowercase p. If there was a capital P present, that animal would be polled. So a horned bull is going to be lowercase p, lowercase p. A horned cow, likewise, is going to be lowercase p, lowercase p. As you can see, all the offspring have horns because all of them are lowercase p, lowercase p. There's no effect from that dominant polled 
allele. The genotype of these animals is all homozygous non-polled and therefore their phenotype is for these calves to all be horned. For our third and final example, let's say we have a heterozygous polled bull and a heterozygous polled cow. That is, both are carrying one copy of big P and one copy of little p. The phenotype of both of these animals, like we said in our earlier example, is that they will be born polled. But as you can see, when we cross them together, they generate a real mix. So one out of four calves will be homozygous polled, two out of four calves will be heterozygous polled, and one out of four calves is homozygous non-polled, so it ends up being horned. Again, in practice, what you see on the ground is three out of four calves are polled, because you can't distinguish visually between the heterozygous polled and the homozygous polled. That's also why when you make two polled animals together, you can get a horned calf. For you farmers making these decisions, you may now be asking, right, so you've given us lots of jargon, what does this mean in practice? For a second, let's assume we want polled calves. I've discussed the benefits of this in a previous technical, but to summarize, it's less labor per calf, it's better welfare because there's fewer mutilations. It's one of those jobs you could envisage becoming a vet-only procedure in this country at some point in the near future. That's certainly the case in parts of Europe, and at risk of doing myself out of a job, it reduces vet and med spend. There does seem to be a prevailing narrative in some quarters that the polled strains of some breeds are inherently inferior in other traits like milk production or growth. The only scientific evidence relates to one paper describing spiral penis deviation in polled Herefords. It might be the case that in some breeds, the polled strains are numerically small and so don't have that diversity of quality in other relevant traits. Again, growth, milk production, calving ease, and so on. But this is different to saying this is because of the polling. Rather, it's because the polled trait hasn't reached some of these otherwise high-performing herds. Given the relative simplicity of an inheritance and the dominance of the poll trait, it should be a relatively easy trait to breed in. If you're a pedigree breeder, you may well know the status of your cows and your bulls. That means you can factor this into decisions about which cow you match to which bull to reduce the likelihood of generating horned calves and also hopefully increasing the number of homozygous polled bulls you can produce for sale. For the commercial cattle producer, who's far less likely to know the polled status of their cattle, unless of course they come from an entirely horned breed, say for example the long horn or an entirely polled breed, so the Angus or the Galloway, for example, you can simply choose a homozygous polled bull. Again, whether that's from a breed that is entirely polled or a bull from a breed with polled strains who's been genetically tested so you know he's a homozygous polled. Using this bull should reduce the number of horned calves to zero. So that is a brief run through of the genetics of polling in cattle. In breeds with polled strains, it is a relatively easy trait to select for, although clearly chosen animals also have to be acceptable in other traits. It's no use using a polled bull if he has terrible structure, poor growth, poor milkiness, poor type or poor temperament. Many pedigree bulls are now genetically tested and remember to differentiate between a homozygous and a heterozygous polled bull. There is one complication, we call these skurs and I'll cover them in a future technical. If you want to learn more in the meantime, of course, talk to your vet, but also take a look at the link in the video description for the Signet webpage on this. It's really clear and well laid out. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, click subscribe, ring the little bell next to it. That means you get notifications about new videos. Hit thumbs up and leave me a comment. Catch you next time.